This is Off to Off Topic, a show where two men with the attention spans of a squirrel try and fail to stay on topic with the day's subject. Where will their oral meanderings take us? Well, stick around and listen, because today's Off to Off Topic Topic is... But anyway, it's time. I go on the weeds how this movie got made, but most of the issues are very similar to other movies. Uh, but I'm 1,500 words in, and I still haven't really talked about the movie yet. So, you, might, you ready to start talking about the movie? Um. So, Darkness, the evil lord of darkness, plan. I, well, I, I put that line there. I, I flubbed it up, but reading it, when it's read, I thought it was funny. And Garfield, what were seeing about when they said, hello, darkness, my old friend? Yes, oh that's God. exactly what you're talking about. Yep, they he was best friends with Simon Garfunkel. Neat. That uh, explains some things. Paul Simon <laughs> would hang out with the ultimate evil. <laughs> yeah, you would. He'd love him. Um, yeah. But he uh, hatches a plan to cause eternal night in winter. Uh, for this, he calls his best minion Blix. And this is how the movie starts. Like, we're we're starting with this. Uh, he charges her to find and kill two unicorns that live in the forest near the castle and bring their horns for a dark ritual to snuff out the sun. Uh, but Blix has an issue. The unicorns incense his evil and would never let them get close enough to hurt them. And Darkness tell, tells them to use innocence as bait and just kind of sends them off to figure it out. And, like, that, they really kind of hammer home how evil Blix is. Because, like, when they, you know, evil, the Darkness is sitting there, they call Blix in, and he's like... Aren't you a son of a bitch? She's like, yep. Like, don't you? You have evil in your heart. You're a total just worst. Just the worst. And she's like, yep, that's me. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously. Like an anime introduction kind of thing. The evilest yeah. of all my henchmen. That's yeah. me. <laughs> okay, again, like this isn't verbatim, but it's, you get the yeah, point. But still, right? yeah. It's, it's a good way to get the point across in a hurry, though. Yeah. <laughs> Exposition yeah, you're like, dump. You're evil. Yes, I am. Let's do this. Yep. <laughs> So, meanwhile, it, by the way, I've been using meanwhile several times because there's a lot of meanwhiles happening here. So, ah. but elsewhere, meanwhile, Princess Lily is venturing into the forest to find Country Jack and the Green. <laughs> find Jack and the Green, a forest dweller who's fallen in love with Lily. She's been coming to the forest quite a while and they clearly love each other. And she actually starts off, like, I didn't really find a way to write the sentence here, but I feel like she's important to say. When she first shows up, she shows up at some villager's house. And she knows, everyone knows, like, oh, hey, Lily, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, you know, so basically you have a princess. She's leaving the castle and goes to the small village nearby. And she happens to know them. And she goes off to find Jack. And he went, he, they run into each other and they're like, oh, innocent and giddy. And I don't know. I think they're a little bit too old. You know, they're late teens and they're acting like, Act, I don't know. Acting like they're eight years old. old or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're acting like little kids. Skipping but, around the maypole and this and that and stuff. And Yeah, but whatever. You know, it's fine. You know, it, I'm quibbling at that point. Yeah, you know, At the time when I was a kid, I didn't really notice it. But as an adult, I'm looking back like, mm-hmm. I don't know, you guys are kind of old for this. But anyway, in order to show off, Jack brings Lily to see the most precious animals in the forest. Unicorn. He tells her he's breaking the rules by doing this, but trusts her to stay in her lane. It's like, look, you're a human. <laughs> and you need to like, st- don't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. I, I just like to stay in your lane. I just picture Tom Cruise be like, look, I'm going to show you something, but look here, bitch. Stay yeah. in your lane. You're a human in the forest. <laughs> Listen to me. And that was a mistake because Lily immediately defies Jack's warning and approaches Unicorn. Now, all, although she's, you know, defiant, willful, she's still innocent. Yeah, they and the Unicorn sense her innocence and they allow her to come near and touch her. And I actually, I put a, a picture of it. It's actually, again, they, the cinematography, they really do love like these images that's like iconic and this being one of them. Uh, she's, yeah i recognize this image everywhere yeah yeah i mean it's not is by no means legend like oh this happened for the movie it is very picturesque you yep. know she's on her on her knees in the yep in like a lighting's small, really like, good on this it looks yep. really nice yeah that's, yep. that's good that is good cinematography so at the same time blix is hiding somewhere in the bushes nearby because her timing is exquisite i mean there's a lot of her timing is exquisite. If timing wasn't exquisite, this movie would have happened. <laughs> if daylight so, savings time has happened during this uh, filming, nothing of <laughs> this would have happened because one of the bad guys would have woke up an hour late. I mean, because there, it's there's no scene in which Blix is like tailing after him, or there's even an indication that Blix knows anything about the princess. Like she rolls up, the unicorn comes up, and bam, Blix is there. Just yeah, because and the script be like Blix just happens to come across the right. heroes. <laughs> yeah, there's no establishing. Maybe that was one of the, the scenes they like kept, fell on the floor that got cut out of script but yeah yeah she had like a little magical ball or something to take him to him so we don't know why blitz is there but she's there 
Anyway, she shoots the unicorn with a poison dart, which causes the unicorns to run away. Both Jack and Lily are oblivious of what happened. They just think, you know, the unicorns ran off for no reason. But yeah, horse fly got, got it or something. Yeah, just like, cats, ah, I'm going to the room yep. for no reason. The unicorns do the same thing. There's like, ah, there's yeah, something else out of the forest. They're skittish little critters. And so Jack pissed. He berates Lily for audacity, and she just kind of like laughs it off and changes the subject by showing her a ring. She's like, oh, I know you're mad at me, but look, a ring. And she goes, she says, oh, this is my important ring. Whoever finds this ring, um, well, I'll marry whoever gets it. And she throws it over a small cliff. And it, go, and it falls down the cliff and goes into a pond down below. And he, like, immediately, without even thinking, he, like, immediately just, like, forgets the fight they had. And he jumps off the cliff and, like, dies into the water below. Called the power of being really horny. <laughs> exactly. I mean, fortunately, the water wasn't, like, you know, inches deep. Because, like, that'd be the end of the movie. He jumps off the cliff. Crack. Well, I guess ha. he's dead now. <laughs> He still has a ring in his hand, though, so she's got to marry a paraplegic now. Well, and she wouldn't have to tell him about it. No, she could just be like, ooh, I'm out of here. And she's going back to yeah, the right. castle and no one would ever know. <laughs> Jack's, like, drowning in us, like, three inches of water down below. And she's like, well, I'm going back to my castle. That really sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll cry, I'll cry in my bed for a little bit, but then I'll meet a prince and move on. I mean, he was kind of an asshole over the unicorn thing, so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so... Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, again, Blix tracks down the unicorn and cuts off her horn. Yeah, it's a whole dramatic scene. The print, you know, the unicorn on its knees. Did they use like a little chainsaw? Oh, that that would have been cruel. But nope, it was just you know, she Blix kind of revels in the moment, holds the sword high over her head. Again, picturesque. Yeah. And for the ultimate off. realism in the scene, they actually installed a horn on a real horse surgically, yep. and they had to cut it off. And <laughs> so. And of course, the effects, the moment the horn comes off, the effects are instant. And winter hits the forest like Elsa let it go. The uh, pond, yeah, I like that. <laughs> uh, I like that line. The, uh, the, pond, the pond Jack's hit instantly freezes over. And he nearly drowns with the ice, like immediately. He, he gets down, he can't find the ring, and he kind of gives up, he goes up for air, and there's ice there. So he's like, oh, he's pounding the ice and trying to get out of it. And um, does Lily, like, go down there and help him? <laughs> nah, she just fucks off and leaves his ass to drown. She's like, ah, ice is cold. Good luck with that. Yeah, the wind picks up. It starts blowing everywhere. And she's just like, yee, um, this looks like a bad thing. I'm out. And she's, she bounces. And skittish like a unicorn. Yep. And she runs back to the village and hides in the same small cottage where she ran into the villagers. And then she finds them all frozen. Like, they... The implication is they might be dead, but it's not really. They're just kind of like, you know, frozen in carbonite. They're always like, uh, frozen in place. Because <laughs> again, I don't know why that didn't happen to her, but it happened to all the villagers. And so she's hiding in this village. Uh, it, well, I say keep on saying village. It's one house. So I guess they didn't have the budget for like multiple houses. They just keep on flashing the interior of this, and the exterior of this village is one. just off camera. We promise. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, there's villages. I promise. This, yep. this is the edge of the village. So yeah. she's in there. And again, with exquisite timing. Blix and company happen to camp just outside the house. And they're and Lily overhears them like talking shit. They're like, Yeah, you know, that stupid girl. Thankfully we got to shoot that unicorn because that girl wore the thing. She's like, Oh my god. And then she hears then all of a sudden a hooded figure just comes out of nowhere. And they start speaking. And darkness speaks through the figure. So like it is absolutely darkness. It's our it's Tim Curry's voice. But it's like a kind of um floating, kind of looks like uh one of those evil things from Harry Potter, like uh, a wraith. Right. A wraith, okay. Yeah, and just kind of like hovering in the air. You, you know, just, you know what I mean? You hooded figure. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, the, but darkness speaks to the figure and informs Blix eternal night cannot happen unless they have both. So they got one unicorn horn, but that's not enough. They need to get the other one too. And honestly, like, you know, the scene, there's a slight humor scene where the small black knight blunder, who's been, these guys have been talking shit for a while now. And he's overcome with overconfidence. He swipes the unicorn from Blix and he, he's like, I got the horn now. What are you going to do? And he threatens to use the power of the horn to attack darkness and replace it. I'm going to become the darkness. And darkness kind of just like the foot of figure just kind of stands there and is like immediately just knocks him down. And then uh, fucking he raises his hand a little bit and um, an undead just pops out from nowhere. So there's like a dead body and like a mummified dead body just pops out of the ground just with no warning. And like it sees his blunder and just hauls him away in the night. And Blix and the other guy is like, well, there he goes. And they move on. Like, there's, he, he shouldn't have ran his mouth. Yeah. like Because yeah. Yeah, that's probably not the first time something like that's happened being oh, in that not. crew. Like, you didn't want none? Don't come get some. You know, just like, should have shut up. You were fine. <laughs> but the moment you, you decided to, to break out of your lane, once again, stay in your lane. A couple too many to. drinks of grog and he got mouthy. Yep, he sure did. And he got hauled off uh, yeah. into the darkness. Uh, never to be heard again until, you know, later on. So... 
after all this, Lily, you know, is now upset. You know, she's upset that she realized that it's her fault. This is all happening. Didn't listen to Jack. And because she didn't listen to Jack, you know, the unicorn got trapped. And so now back to Jack. Without the ring or ring now or Lily, he breaks out of the ice and he's just alone. And so he's looking around for her, Lily, can't find her, but he does run to his friend. Uh, for, uh, well, the first was for his friends was named Honeythorpe Gump. A brown Tom, a screwball, and Una. Yeah, I mentioned those guys earlier. Uh, hey, whimsical British names in this, or English Absolutely. names for this, yeah, don't it's, they? Yeah, uh, it's a, totally. But Gumble Gump's, bump, Google funk, you know? Now, Gump, they're like, hey, what's up? But they suspect something. You know, they suspect Jack did something to cause this, and they kind of like, you know, what's up with this? Do you know what's going on? I know you're you, lying. Something what's like up? this happens is because you did something stupid, Jack. Yeah, that, what yeah. What your horny ass do now? They're like, I, I, come on, man. This let us know what happened. And so Jack confesses <laughs> he took Lily to go see the unicorn. And humans touching a unicorn, well, humans being around unicorns is not good, but touching a unicorn is like, a, and Gump is initially pissed and unwilling to help Jack. Like, he is. And so he, in order to kind of, like, wash it over to help Jack fix everything, he offers a riddle. And if he answers the riddle, he'll be forgiven. If he answers it wrong, Gump's going to kill him. And, like, he, this kid's creepy, man. Like, the, the guy that got this, his, like, raspy, high-pitched, gravelly, raspy voice. And, like, when I say half-naked, like, he's literally wearing a loincloth, and that's it. So it, it's, you know, this I like kid. Like the fact it's a dude named Gump who's living in a forest. ba da ba ba da ba so this is the riddle. Let's see if you can do it. You're not gonna. What is a bell that never rings? Yet its knell makes the angels sing. Um, what is? Uh, guess. Hold on. Uh, what kind of bell? Uh, 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 I was trying to think of a flower that's got bell in the name, but okay, uh, go ahead. You got it right there. It's a flower. Oh, did I? Okay, yeah, you flower. Yeah, you guessed. Blue bell. That's <laughs> what I was trying to think of. A blue bell. Holy okay. shit! I would have died, dude. He would have killed me. You would have won because it was yeah. a blue bell. A uh, blue bell. It's uh, to hear it ring means your life is at an end. So that the angels sing. Like you know, I had, had no clue. And <laughs> but no, you're absolutely right. And you even answered it kind of like how Jack answered it. He first answers a flower, gum freezes, and then he says a blue bell. So like your way of getting there it's was like exactly a freaking how what's his butt Jack off of Jeopardy. He's like, ooh, need a little more specific, please. What yeah. kind of a flower? <laughs> you did real good. So yay, yay! Look at me go. I wouldn't have died so far in this movie. So Jack answers correctly and sets Gum off. Like he thrashes around for a minute or so, and then all he gets up like nothing happened, and they set off to go undo the curse. So after some searching, they find the un the injured unicorn who's barely holding on alive. And it's mates nearby, and that's when you see what's furious is running around. You know, it's a horse. Now I get sent with his arms crossed, be like, "No, sir, I don't like it." Hey. They conclude the only way to fix the winner is to find and return the horn to the un the injured unicorn. Not uninjured. I keep on saying uninjured. No, the injured. Huh. Like the one that's the, the dying unicorn. Well, when uh, you cut the horn off of a unicorn, you get an un uninjured horse, technically, so. They leave Brown Tom to watch over the unicorn and search for some armor and weapons for Jack, and, which they quickly find. I mean, I'm a, I am I wanted to watch the movie before I, I did this. Um, I never got around to it, um, and I'll have to explain the reasons why later. Um, but... I don't remember how they, like, immediately got it. I think maybe Una or, you know, Gump knew, like, oh, hey, by the way, I, I've got this cave I can take you that has a bunch of stuff in it. Poncho it's like, or something like that. Yeah, right away. They take him to a cave, and they go down there. And Una goes down there with him. And now keep in mind, Una is a small little Tinkle bear like fairy. I mean, it's like, you know, this little, you know what I'm talking about? Like, almost like little things from the... Bright or whatever you want to call them. Or, uh, well, yeah. no, I was actually thinking more of a, oh, my God, I can't remember, the Ewok movie. Yeah, you know, those little fairy things. It kind of yeah, looks, she, she looks like that. Called fairy things. Yeah. Yeah. The wisps. Um, oh, there we go. I think that's what they were actually. Yeah. yeah. The wisps. And so she looks like that. And I think she's actually supposed to be a wisp. But when she's in there, she all of a sudden like magics into human size. Like she still has wings, but she's like large. And he freaks out for me. He's like, oh my God, he didn't know she could do that. <laughs> Come to find out, no one knows that she can do that. And she's like, you know, she's like, hey, by the way, I love you. And he's like, uh, cool. Yeah. Thanks, but no thanks. I, yeah, I, I love Lily. And she takes it okay she's not not totally cool with it she's kind of pissed but um she's still like okay you know i still love you just don't tell anybody i can get big because if you tell gump he's gonna be furious and I, you know people one kind of running theme is everyone including jack is scared of gump so i don't know what he did but apparently he's done some heinous shit because he's he is an elf so he's been living he's, he's not a boy he's been living like probably for hundreds of years so he's uh probably was known for baiting other children to epstein island so, oh, absolutely. That's what, yeah. the, you know, he was, that, actually, that was he, never, never land that he was taking them to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he was definitely, he wasn't on the list cause he was the list. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs>
So <laughs> while this is happening, Lily finds Brown Tom. Again, meanwhile, <laughs> Lily finds Brown Tom and the injured unicorn. She begs for forgiveness and tries to warn him of what he's ever heard, but he just basically tells her to fuck off. You know, he's not listening to her. He's like, meh, you're human, and this is your your fault, so get away from here. And as she's trying to plead with him, miraculously Blix, again, with no indication that he knew who Lily even was outside of, like, the person he baited, just magically just followed her ass and found the unicorns, you know, tr- used her to find the unicorns, and they, uh, I think they kill, they attack Brown Tom, I'm not sure if he dies or not, but they attack Brown Tom, they, uh, grab her and the unicorn. So they get the injured unicorn, the lip, the uninjured unicorn, and Lily. They get all three. Or meet for and, dinner. Nice. Right. And so, meanwhile, back ah. to back. <laughs> You're going to have to do a, like a control F on maybe and see how what the word count is. Right. <laughs> so he's well on his way to infiltrate the castle. As he wades through a swamp, he's attacked by Meg Mucklebones, the character I mentioned earlier. And after some back and forth, she's like, I, he's like, are you going to eat me? She's like, yep, I'm totally going to eat you. Like she's, she's playing with her food. And it's actually, again, I just can't stress. I really, YouTube it. It's creepy, especially for a kid's movie. It And it is, you cannot see the actor underneath. I, it was a total shock when I found out who played this character. It was, re- they really, look at a really picture did a real job. Yeah, it did a, they did a, yeah, they did a yeah, real they do good a really job. They do a really good job making them look wet, too, with all that yeah, glycerin yeah, on them. Th- yeah. I, that, thank you. I, I actually didn't, I left that part out, but yes, like it's dripping. It is yep. really good. If you want to make stuff look kind of creepy and unsettling, you got to make it look wet like that. If and you don't so, use water, I guess you use like glycerin or like cooking oil sometimes on it. Yeah. Apparently it's kind of funky on the actors. So uh, but, yeah. Jack distracts her by complimenting. It's like, oh, you're beautiful. And she's like, oh, I am. And of course she eats it all up and, you know, very Trumpian. And then... <laughs> While she's all like, she's just about to attack him. Like she's like, she's having fun, but you know she's about to like attack. And as she lunges, he like beheads bat- bat- her. Just what? Again, keep in mind this kid has never held a sword before, has never killed any before. But for some reason, he's just like a natural. Come, killing One comes swipe. surprisingly easy for this yeah. young man. People One should swipe. be more alarmed than they really are. <laughs> yeah, like wow, man, you took her head off real easy. So, but they get you know they kill hit her real fast, and almost immediately afterward, they fall into a trap. And they end up in a castle dungeon. It's just uh, like, oh, she's dead. One step. Boom. <laughs> so it's coincidence like, that they just want to write into that trap. Although all this yeah. coincidence and finding stuff fast makes more sense when you consider it's all in a soundstage. But up, anyways. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. we don't have we don't have the time or space for them to like right. have any kind of like journey. It's like we're we need one thing after the next. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And again, as a great example of why 80s movies are so amazing, the dungeon they land in is gloriously fucked up. Like, there's mutilated bodies everywhere, there's random screens in the distance, and one specific thing that I still revert to this day as a kid, there's a shadow of a guy in the wall on hit like laying on the back on a table as a shadow of someone else with a big cleaver slowly chopping him up into death alive. Awesome. Like for, they're chopping his legs up. He's like every so often it's not even like screaming and yelling. Like you could tell this guy's so done. They chop he goes like oh and his arms kind of raise up a little bit and he sits up for a second and lays back down then chop oh it's like dude this is so messed up. Uh, and again, this is a kids' movie, and it's but it's the eighties. So it was very much, and I, that, I was just about to say that kind of feels like part of that Brothers Grimm influence they were talking about exactly. earlier. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and like yeah, this story will stick with the children more if we sprinkle a little traumatization in with it. So the party they're, they're not wrong up, though. No, they're not wrong. Well, the party wakes up in a cage in the kitchen. Desperate, Jack breaks Una's trust and reveals that she can get big, so she can get the cage. She's all like. We need to get out of here. He's like, Una, get the key. And Gump's like, she can't get the key. She's too small. And like, you could tell Una's like, what are you doing, man? And he's like, no, she can get the key. And then she turns big. And of course, Gump is pissed because, you know, that's what he does. He's mad. And, but, you know, what's he going to do? They're trapped in the cage. And so Una, she's like, okay. Una goes, I'll do it for you, but kiss me first. And Gump's like, immediately goes like, yeah, man, kiss her. Do it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, if you want to hand down here, his pants, do it. Kiss her. Right. Or talk. Do it. Um, and it even sh- and then Uda even like turns herself to a likeness of Princess Lily, and Jack's just about to kiss her. He's like, "No, true love," and she gets pissed off and flies away. But fortunately, she comes back the key, and, like gives him the keys, and then fucks off. Like you know, she's willing to let him escape, but then she runs away. So you know, I guess it worked out. But it's like, come on, man, 
you know, what's the harm? You know, it, whatever. Well, as they flee and come across, they, they flee the cage and they come across a large pie that's on its way to the oven, but they hear muffled cries inside. They peel back the crust and they find Blunder, now without his armor. And it turns out he's actually a fallen dwarf. He's all remorseful and sad. He gives us some advice, but, you know, it's... It is kind of like pathetic. And do they rescue him? And, and does he join on their quest? What do you think? He says, I'm do, comfortable being a pie. Leave me here. No. What Instead, what happens is as he's there giving advice, he's like begging to get free. They hear the, the chef coming. And so they just bounce. And they, huh. they, leave, they leave him in the pie and he gets dragged off to be cooked. The end. That's the end for Blunder. <laughs> <That's... Yeah. laughs> so, I mean, he'll be back in the next, next episode as dinner. Or actually, yes, dessert. exactly. Uh, the blunder gave everybody the runs that night as his final <laughs> act of vengeance. <laughs> Never mind Montezuma's revenge, blunder's revenge. <laughs> so, back to Lily. Next okay. time I get the runs, I'm gonna call it blunder's revenge. Damn yeah, straight. Now, meanwhile, Lily, she wakes up surrounded by gifts in a large dining room. She starts to explore with, uh, when a living black goth dress begins to dance around her, ch- enchanting her. It's actually pretty cool. It's like they had the actress who was uh, dancing. They put like a sparkly black hood over them so you don't see any skin. It literally looks like a garment that's come to life with a fake br- person in there. But honestly, the dance goes on way too. I mean, it's dancing around. It's supposed to be enchanting her. And it's like, I think it's maybe two or three minutes, but. It was cool uh, for 15 seconds for three minutes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good it's, Lord. it's, it is cool for, let's say, let's go say far as 30 seconds. You know, yeah. 30 seconds is cool, but it is entirely too long. And it's mm, not even a good yeah. dance. I mean, it's, it's fine, but it's not My like. My brain immediately like, goes to the Star Wars Christmas special where they had that one dance scene in the middle of it goes on for like five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's almost like this? that. Not quite as cheesy, but not that far off. No, but in the end, you know, they, it's really cool. Like the dance, the dress, you know, she's dancing along and they're like, you know, uh, together apart together apart and then all of a sudden like the camera cuts in together and the screen turns black for half a second and now lily's wearing the dress and not only is she wearing a dress but she's also like good totally gothed out she has pale white skin she's black eyeliner on black lipstick i also included the picture of that see that and i'm guessing uh probably setting a lot of dudes fetishes for the rest of their life at that moment oh, oh yeah definitely he looks like what's her butt from a, skel- a Skeletor sidekick. Yeah, and that dress is cut real low. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it goes from a shoulder, like her nape, nape of her neck, all the way down to her belly button. It's like it's just yeah. So it, yeah, she's... Def- yeah. That that that's definitely a look that affected many young men from that pack in that day. Absolutely. I would I would have been one too if I had seen that. I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna be doing oh, something about that later. <laughs> <It's> yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, so uh, she checks herself, on the, but as she goes to look at herself in the mirror, kind of like, oh my God, that's when um, darkness Oh my God, I'm up. hot. I want to be a bad yeah. guy now. <laughs> that's when you finally see darkness. You know, it, instead of like, you know, so far you saw him in like kind of neon-y silhouette and you saw him as the hood of her. Now you actually see him at, for who he is. And he comes stepping out of the mirror and it's like one large, you see his hook come out first. Boom. And it's a big goat hoof. And you see his hand come out of the mirror. Now for the 80s, it looked amazing. For now, it's fine you know it, and it really isn't fair to judge you know cg 1980 cg versus now it's not fair but was it, it a cgi is... they were doing with that one or slight i mean just because they could do a practical effect of someone coming out of a mirror you know so it it wasn't a lot it wasn't a lot but it was some and it just can it... do some effects coming through a mirror i remember seeing a special effects thing where they did it for a movie in the 90s i think but we'll talk about well, that again later. 85 <laughs> so yeah be, well, again, no, looked, I mean, it was practical effect, like they were just using a sheet of clear water. Or oh, I got like you, I got Reflection you. off of that, yeah. Well, this actually, I think they did. Um, it was, you know, a CG as they could get back then. Yeah. Uh, maybe they could a different way, but they didn't. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll find out scene, soon one of these days, I'm sure. Right. This scene alone should have gotten an Oscar for the cinematography, in my opinion. That's another picture I included on here. The She passes out, and when he's leaning over, and actually, the, the picture I found, there's actually a, a better picture out there, but wider shot. It's like a lot longer uh, that include like more of the, the scene. Like, the scene you're seeing now to the right, it's actually to the far right of a very long, you know, a wide-angle lens. And yeah. it just, it looks so good. This is, I don't know, this is the only one I could find. All the other ones are there like, no, you're the pay for this image. I'm like, I'm not going to pay for this image. I'm just going to use it to show. No, I'm not doing that. So this is the best image I could find that I can actually download. It is cinemat- cinematography, cinemat- cinematographical oh, yeah. movie. 
and again, photography like, is great. This is just a sea, a, a still shot, but like the wind was blowing, so his cape was billowing. It was, it was a really good, like one of my favorite shots in the movie. And so then she wakes up, and darkness tries to seduce her. He's all like, um, "Hey, blah 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 blah." And there's actually a really great line. It's your sign, calls, baby. I got an eye rock out in the parking lot. Eh? And she's kind of defiant. It kind of pisses him off. But there's a really great line. I'm actually thinking about including on a sticker on my dude, where she's like, "You're an animal." He's like, "We are all animals, my dear." <laughs> Stuff like that. No, uh, it, it's actually it's really good. And again, all with the voice of Tim Curry and him just like totally. And see, he believes the sin of luring the unicorn has tainted her pure soul. And now that she's been tainted, she's all geared up for super evil. It's like you know, that doesn't work like that, man. You don't like oh. I stepped on a bug, so now I'm ready for 9-11. You know, it doesn't work that way. You know, you have to To Jack who just lopped off somebody's head without thinking twice about it. Very true. I mean, yeah. it is, it's the evilness. It, it, he goes from like, oh, one small thing, and now you're ready for it. So, but after some back and forth. You cheated on your third grade spelling test. Hmm? <laughs> Good, now you're ready for human sacrifice. Right. Oh, kill this man. <laughs> yeah. But she eventually, like, after some back and forth, she does eventually agree to marry him, but on the on one condition that she's allowed to kill the other unicorn. And he just buys it. He's like, oh, okay, great. I'm glad this worked out. Like, no, like, come on, man. Think think about it. Like, give her a test something first. Like, I don't know, give her a child. Okay, kill this child, then you can kill the unicorn first. You know, just... Pure evil. But, yeah, you'll do it. Obviously, you won't lie to me. <laughs> yeah, right? And so, but, but you know... She, She's just like, sure, why not? And so he he laughs evilly in the scene ends. And of, of course, because this movie has exquisite timing. Meanwhile, while they're in conversation, Jack and his friends were nearby. <laughs> it's like, uh, and you know, while he's doing his super villain rant, he goes, hey, you know that thing over there? It sure would suck if that thing killed me, basically being the sun. He was like, oh yeah, the sun kills me. So, um, uh. Just always hate that. The bad guy's like, hey, yeah. here's my one weakness. Be sure not to exploit it. I mean, it's right yeah. over there on a shelf, too. Just could be a good well, guy. That's, he's like, yeah, I need to kill these unicorns because to get rid of the sun, because that, that sun up there, I'm just like vampires. It can yeah, totally yeah. do me in. And <laughs> so they're over like quickly scribbling on their three by five cars. Like, <laughs> huh. Sunlight, so, sunlight is the secret. And so darkness sets up the ritual, and Jack and company uh, go out. Like, they're, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And they find a room full of like these large, um, like polished mirrors. And they're like, oh, sweet mirrors. And so they set up a very intricate, like, reflection. Like, okay, we're going to get this here and we'll slowly go up and get someone to go to the very tippy top of the castle when the sun's going down to reflect the light. They do a Legend so, of Zelda puzzle. Very very much so. And yeah. I'm like, and even to this day, sometimes I, I try to reflect one light off a mirror to another mirror and the, the light slowly it dissipates. You know, it, you the light you get at the, it's not a laser, it's light. It's just generic light. And so by the time you get to, I don't know, even the second or third mirror, the light's almost not. But you know what? Let's toss that reality out the window. We are in a world where with the light that comes in from the very first mirror is as much as or more intense than the last mirror. That's that's the world we're in. Corn magic. So, exactly. So, but meanwhile, meanwhile, darkness gives Lily a sword to kill the last unicorn. And surprise, surprise, she cuts the chain holding him down and frees the beast. You know, and now she hasn't let him go like outside they're in the deepest darkest dungeon so they she frees the unicorn i don't know what her next step was because she didn't have an kind of freaked out just like ran off a ledge or something right away or yeah, something she had no exit fire. plan nothing she just like cut the chain let him go and then furious darkness pip slaps her she just goes into her consciousness this immediately slap done so and then dark his, jack his pip slap yep then uh darkness show, or jack shows up out of nowhere and they start fighting you know it's a very brief fight because for again jack doesn't have much you know fight experience and it's actually a really cool scene where darkness charges at him like a bull and jack is like pinned against the wall and darkness the horn slam around him so it's a nice scene where you know darkness face looking at him and he calls him boy it's just like who are you boy and it's like it's again great scene there is, this movie is full of great scene and so but then you know a brief, after a very brief fight because you know jack really can't do shit to him they finally get the light and there's actually a, a really tense quote tense scene where the dwarf who had the very tippy top of the mountain with the last mirror he gets to the very top and he gets so exhausted he passes out and he sleeps there for a little bit so that's why things didn't go right then finally he wakes up just before the sun can be set like the bomb is down to two <laughs> it's like oh no and so he moved, gets the mirror up, the light goes all the way down, the very intense scene is like, will the light make it in time? And all the light goes down there, and it nails the darkness right in the chest. And of course, he gets blasted back like he hit by a cannon, and goes flies right toward, guess what? There just happened to be 
a vortex nearby that he that earlier in the movie he Doctor was using to talk to his dad. Never said who his dad was, but he's like father. And he's talking to the doctor, so you assume it's Satan or somebody. But they never actually clarify who father. But he's in the void. Yeah, dude who looks like Rick Moranis. Exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, but then as he's you know he's the light's still hitting him, even though they just established like a minute ago the sun was going down, all was going to be gone. Is it one of those two where you get to see the light beam actually move through the sky because light moves slowly in movies? Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah. You, yep. From mirror to mirror, you see the light going down. Yep. Yep. And um and again like the sun the sun coming down the light hidden from the mirror to the darkness is way more powerful than any kind of this would be a, a million magical lumens. amplifying mirrors yeah and he's you up against the stopped himself you know, the the door to the void and he's his nails are digging into the door and he's sliding and then he screams out yo you can't kill me darkness is in everyone's heart as long as there's darkness in people's hearts I'll never truly be gone and then Jack cuts his hand off he plunges into the darkness so it, darkness falls in the dark of the void and he kept the so, hand and made it into an ashtray like people do, used to do with gorilla hands yep right yeah well, nice. no actually he made it into a he put into his closet full of monkey paws like this is a monkey <laughs> paw. He's like, he's like shut up i don't know where else to put it so the hero party and princess make it back to the injured unicorn before it dies and place the horn back on his head a very dramatic scene and of course it fits perfectly like so they do nope. they like screw it back into place? It's like a fine threaded horn. You just chick, 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 chick. no, you it, that even better. But nope, they just like touched it. And it was immediately just doop, back up. Like there's no super glue, no nothing. Just it. They touch no it together, magical salve like, or nothing. Nope. Just they yeah. touch one edge to the other, and it's a perfect fit. Turns out they're actually naturally detachable, and they fall off all the time in nature. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, it fits perfectly. The curse, just as quickly as it began, the curse winter in. And Princess, but, but, problem is, Princess Delay is now in a cursed coma due to her injury. And now that Stubber has returned, the pond is fixed. And for reasons we don't know, like, we don't know why he thinks of this and why it works, Jack jumps in the water from the very beginning, finds the ring, places it on a finger, and she wakes up. Again, there's no establishing anything the, that would show why this would work or how he thought of it. But there we go. Getting married to dude is such a powerful aphrodisiac, it just brings you back from death, I guess. 100%. So now that Lily's awake, she and Jack profess their love and the unicorns reunite and run around and dance. And the movie ends as the unicorns run off into the distance and Jack and Lily go off into the sunset together and the woodland friends happily wave goodbye. A very, you know, generic kind and of... And does he have like a big stretchy long arm that reaches out through the top of the limo and waves side to side oh, as they go off? Oh my god, I love that scene. Thank you for mentioning yeah. that. I love that scene so much. <laughs> for, for those of you don't know, the Fantastic yeah. Four movie back in the early 90s had a horrifyingly dumb scene <laughs> mr fantastic it's, waving out the top of the limo with this long rubber arm just woo. i i we definitely gotta do a podcast of that if you don't do it i'm doing it okay. so for whatever reason the american release the camera pans up and darkness is laughed in the british version it didn't the credits roll and the most 80s music you ever fucking heard of but the play the american yeah. studios wanted the possibility of a sequel would be right. my guess yeah well uh and you did not mishear me it was actually 80s techno pop music that played through the whole movie. The entire track of Legend was scored and played by a German electric music band, Tangerine Dream. And if you've never seen see that coming, movie, in. <laughs> what? I actually heard of Tangerine Dream, to be honest, but no, I, mean, I didn't picture you saying there's going to be a, a techno beat. Yeah, the entire movie, just imagine the entire decade of the 80s dry humping a synthesizer. All the way. You get the general vibe of the soundtrack. I, I remember watching this as a kid, and the soundtrack didn't really stand out, because why would it? It was the 80s. Yeah, I was a kid in the 80s, and that was just the vibe at the time. Yep. And but once but, I got a little looking older, back, you're like, what in the world is going on? Yeah, now that I got a little older and saw other fantasy movies, particularly Lord of the Rings as well, like that's you know, Lord of the Rings, I'm gonna keep on referring to that because that's like you know, quintessential. Like, you know, they, of course, there are famous for, fantasy movies before that, there were fantasy movies after that, but I think but, we can all say the gold standard, yeah, they really made Rings would be kind of weird with the soundtrack from Run Lola Run under it, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, I was actually said, imagine Lord of the Rings if had, for the time it came out, in, instead of like having you know, an orchestra soundtrack, had a new metal soundtrack. You know, huh. gold, Gandalf Cor fixes down the bad you know, Balrog as Limp Biscuit plays in the background. I was about to say, Corn does the soundtrack for uh... <laughs> I was, I actually did, I was debating whether to put Corn or Limp Biscuit. I went for the worst one, Limp Biscuit. Yeah, yeah. And here's the thing, I, they're like, I still have a special place in my heart for Limp Biscuit. I listen to Limp Biscuit, but now that I'm like, again, looking back, I'm like, I don't know, man, that Limp Biscuit uh, guy, <laughs> it's not great. Why was I so angry? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, originally the score of the movie was composed by a more classical composer called Jerry Goldsmith. He did the first, like, the first soundtrack to the movie, or the score. He actually scored Sounds a bunch of other movies. too, actually. Yeah, well, he scored a bunch of other movies, such as, I'll take a second, I'm going to list his movies he's done. And some of the movies, uh, lots of movies, some before and a lot after this. So he did Logan's Run, Chinatown, The Omen, Alien, Planet of the Apes, Poltergeist, Air Force One, L.A. Confidential, The Mummy, Secret of Nim, Gremlins, Total Recall, Basic Instinct, and Mulan. So this guy knew what he was doing. Yeah, he, he, had he did. Established or a composer, almost like the Ridley Scott of soundtracks. Basically, yeah. <laughs> he's that level of so, famous. Yeah. And so did the original score of the movie. And so and I've actually seen this kind of movie in the early 2000s when they, you know, with the release of a special DVD. And to be honest, it really does work a lot better. I mean, it doesn't stand out like Lord of the Rings soundtrack does where you hear a Lord of the Rings soundtrack, you fucking know, no question. Oh, wow, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like, oh my God, this is Legend soundtrack. It, it was, but it worked. It was good. It, it felt better to what you're watching. And unfortunately, they also butchered the movie editing. The original runtime was 125 minutes long but it was trimmed to 113 to quote get rid of the fat I'm like oh fine you people do a lot of time like there's some info dumps they don't need because they have it somewhere else in the movie you know like something happens where it's just you know it, it's just not neat you know like we we got the point with having that other steam there so uh, let's go ahead and just let's trim it kind of like how um was it x-men oh my god days of futures past like you know rogue was actually in the original movie days of Future past but after they watched the movie they're like uh she's not really needed yeah you know, she shows up and there's no information given that really that you don't find out elsewhere in the movie so they cut her out entirely it's kind of like what it that little small of a part would have cheesed off fans more than made them happy yeah so you know they they got rid of a lot of stuff yeah and it's fine you know i, I can live with that but then they cut it down again by another 20 minutes minutes to make it 80 or 95 minute movie. not for any story reasons just because the suits wanted it shorter and that that kind of editing pisses me. you know they're like there's cutting time just to cut time yeah now this or this version was actually shown in the theaters in great britain but in good old us of a they cut it down again to make it 89 minutes the reasoning was European audiences are more sophisticated where they can pick up subtleties where in America need to be hit over the head. So like that's why they get a little bit more nuanced than Europeans. They also got more cla- the classical score of Goldsmith in their original release while we got Tangerine. Basically, they saw the same reason we got Sorcerer's Stone versus a Philosopher's Stone or Harry Potter. You know, like America's done about Philosopher's Stone. That's hard to say. Make a Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah. Now, why, why, why would they do this? Why would they slow the runtime and change the score? Well, I'll answer that with two little stupid test screenings. They, took the t- they had taken Legend to Orange County of all places and screened the movie in front of a bunch of stone. Dumb assholes didn't like the score or the original. So the, they thought the score sucked, and they, but you know, the, the score sucked, but it worked. Like the one they chose with Tangerine Dream. They want something more modern. So that's where Tangerine Dream came in. And they cut down the runtime, but it wasn't great. It happened. A lot of movies out there have director's cuts because the studio might be calling these times out and we think it's bullshit. Here it is. And, you know, or- there's too another reason they'll cut time off of it. And this is less common, but if they cut enough time off it, sometimes you get more showings per day in a theater and thus yep. uh, rank up your box office numbers too. And that's entirely you possible. Know. Like, I, yeah. I, I didn't read, like, I don't remember off the top of my head if that's a reason by 100% of most likely. Yeah, I'm you not know, saying it's a reason for this movie, but I've heard it as a reason for other movies. Where it's well, like, I, I promise you it's a factor. Like, just yeah. hearing that, like, you, you're right. I've heard that too. And yeah. I actually, that it's almost always money when you come down to the brass yeah. tax of it. So I, I, there's not a doubt in my mind that was the factor when they did this in here. So, but in the end, as I mentioned, the end of the movie had Princess Lily and Jack running off together and his Woodland friends laugh and say goodbye. First issue. Jack Woodland friends may have forgiven Lily for a part of the unicorn attack, but they still don't like humans. They didn't want her there and they didn't like nothing more than all the humans to fuck off. And in the end, she still was the issue. Like, she is still a reason why the whole thing happened in the first place. Like, I can't, I can't see. They're like, okay, you helped us. You can live. You know, but no. They were like, bye. They all happily waving. They and plus they weren't even super thrilled Jack was hanging around in the first place. So again, like I don't know, I'm kind of no tearing him a new one over that. Yeah, there's no reasons why they would be suddenly cool with her and like happily waving her away. They're second happy issue. because they're both leaving and they assumed they were never coming back. <laughs> right. Well, the second issue: Princess Lily's a princess. 
What the fuck is she going to do with some commoner who lives in the woods? Hell, he probably wouldn't do that great living in a small village, never mind trying to navigate the minefield that's palace politics. Keep in mind, this is the Dark Ages. There's a very real possibility. in a cage being the wild boy of the forest or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a very real possibility Jack would be found with a throat slit somewhere in the castle. Yep. I mean, like, oh, daddy, I want to marry this boy who has no lineage of anything ever. And he, she's like, oh, okay. Hey, honey, why don't you go take a bath? We'll take care of Jack. Oh, he fell yeah. down the stairs. I was out training with our knights and something horrible yeah. happened. Oh, right. my God. <laughs> so, like, why why he thinks he would be able to do well there. I mean, I, him I can understand. He, like, he's knight, but she should have known better. He does, have, he does have darkness's hand. Maybe that'll just be enough to, like, get him through society. Be like, look what there I cut go. off. Ah. Look what I did. Well, he's got this, like, hanging around his neck as, like, a uh, trophy. Now, the third issue, and this is, like, one of the bigger issues, like, the biggest issue. This dwarfs the other two. The third issue is Jack isn't human. He's not like they they don't explicitly say that like because you're thinking oh wait the forest folk didn't like humans why were they so cool jack again he's not human he's based he's on like jack and the wood sprite or something isn't he right he's again like i said in the beginning he's jack of the green from british folklore and doesn't matter how much you passionately love the princess can't be part of the uniform uh, the human world he is part of the forest and you know what would he do when he gets to the city or the towns or whatever he's it's no green how does he survive like he is not and again, we don't like, even know if their genitalia are compatible he might have like some weird three-headed snake thing for a dingus or he might be like ken we're just a little yeah he could just have nothing down there or have a hole of his own (laughs) so yeah (laughs) yeah again when i researched jack the green like i mentioned earlier it was just he's just a kid who lives in the woods he's nothing special but no powers but again not human and so the problem is the the reason why they changed it was the teens who didn't like in the original ending he stays she owes like then she walks off to the sunset and he's happily waving with his friends. And they're like, she's like, oh, I'll be here tomorrow. Basically say she'll, I'll, she'll visit again. Okay, fine. Fair enough. You know, like the forest friends are probably going to tolerate her and Jack's still going to play with her and stuff. But Jack, it doesn't go anywhere because he belongs in the forest. She belongs in the other real world. And there will come a time where she won't come back and he'll still be there because that's where he belongs. And that's their original ending of the movie. And also, it is a very Brothers Grimm ending. You know, it's right. like, they're not, they don't Test have Test audiences demand the girl and the boy get together at the end. That's that's exactly yep. what happens. That's exactly Test, what it is. And, Test audiences are like, no, dude, the guy has to get the girl in the end. Otherwise, it's a yeah. dumb movie. And that's a, that's also a perfect uh, imitation because, again, eight, 1980s Orange County stoners. Yeah, people like that dirty Tony Hawk and such. Right. He might so, have been in that test audience. This might all be Tony Hawk's fault. Let's blame Tony Hawk, regardless. I'll yeah, call, I'm, I'm going to email Hawk. him and let him know. <laughs> so the critics, and when this came out, the critics were harsh. The Rotten Tomatoes aggregate is only 42% positive, and the average of 5.1 out of 10. The Metacritic gave it an anemic 30 out of 100 rating based on 11 critics deeming, deeming it generally unfavorable. Most critics love the visuals, but lambasted the story. One popular critique was the for the popular author Neil Gaiman, who said, glimmers of intelligence here and there. He said more, but I just cut out of that. Like, there was a longer quote, but the, the intelligence here and there, not enough women to sexually harass. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sorry, I had to throw that in. Uh, honestly, I say fuck them credits. You know, the movie yeah. isn't perfect, sure, but it's totally worth a good watch. And if I had to give it a rating, I'd probably give it a 8 out of 10. Like, it was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it was really it's rating is 73%, it. and that's, a, that's about right on, in line with you. Yeah, I mean, I, that's fine. You also got to remember, there's a difference between a good movie and an enjoyable movie. There's worlds of difference. There's plenty of movies I know that are horrible, but I still like them. Sadly, it didn't do well, didn't do well in the box office either. It pulled a 15.5 million in Canada and U.S. and about 8 million elsewhere uh, for a total of 23.5 million total. And for and the movie cost 25 million to make, so it did. It was a bomb, but it wasn't the worst bomb uh, so I far. That I think. Year. Yeah, I mean, well. It was actually number one in the box office for two weeks. It just, you know, it must have been a really anemic, you know, two weeks because even the movies were at that time. Yeah, actually, I, I, an idiot because I was going to, I actually tried to look that up early. Okay. And I was also going to ask you what was the number one rank, uh, rated movie that year or what, what, what were oh, they the, saying? Oh, oh, that weekend. It was the, the, the yeah, weekend. The okay. weekend it was number one. What was the largest grossing movie from 1985, too? Oh, number one, Back to the Future. That is not surprising. Oh, yeah, wow. 85 was one of those really stacked years. 
You know, every once in a while, there's like a really stacked year for big movies. This is one of them. Oh, wow. Like, Legend wasn't even on the top 191. Well, I call shenanigans. Possibly be under the 1986 ratings. Because I have seen some people say it came out in 1986. Top Gun was the number one topic. Oh, yeah. It's listed as 1986. Um, seen it pop up in 85 and 86. It must have been like on the cusp or something. Well, I'm looking at Box Office Mojo. It's number 57 at 15 point, uh, 50.5 million. Came in right but behind it, Arm and Dangerous featuring John Candy. Damn straight. And Raw Deal. Raw Deal is... I like that movie. That was I a, like that. That was a decent uh, Schwarzenegger movie. That one oh, was kind of weird because if I recall, there was music constantly playing through that whole movie. Like there was always yeah. a song going in the background. And so Legend was number 57. Number 54, Howard the Duck, as explained on Hopped Off Topic. Made uh, Nothing, 300 no, grand no, or this, no love for Howard the Duck. Duck made like <laughs> 300 grand more or something like that. Or Oh, yeah. no, 2 million more. Let's see. Oh, and don't forget, above Howard the Duck, for number 53 was Song of the South. <laughs> ah, <laughs> the yep, re-release. The re-release. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, back to back to legend. <laughs> so, but the, as I said, it's not the worst bomb in history. I think I think the Borderlands now currently has that title, but I'm not sure. Uh, even it was with number this, number one hundred five. See, even with this, it was number one of the box up for two weeks. Uh, da, 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 da. I didn't see what movies came. It was competing against, but whatever. Yeah, that's fine. We know it was for the year, yeah. so. <laughs> There have been several releases on home video, VHS, of course, then DVD, then Blu-ray. The limited edition was released in two, uh, 2021 that includes both cuts of the movie, including documentaries. I cannot find this physical edition anywhere. I, I mean, I try to order, the, I try to watch the director's cut and streaming because I just wanted to watch the longer version with the uh, orchestra store. I couldn't find it. Like the only, I can only find the U.S. theatrical version that's actually on Amazon. And you stream it. Yeah, um, I could have. You ordered, might have to put I, on your pirate hat and go sailing the seas. Yeah, for it. I just didn't. I mean, I kind of want to. I want to own it, but Jenny is like, "What are you gonna do with it after you watch it? Then what?" I'm like, Ugh. "Yeah." You know, Try to get have, the kids to watch it and have them watch 10 minutes of it with you and be like, Dad, this is stupid. I mean, it's kind of like when the Avengers came out a while back. It's like, I want the Avengers Blu-ray. And I got it. And now it's like in a drawer somewhere that I can't. If I if I had to find real quick, I, I could find it. But if I had to find it real quick, I can tell you exactly where it's at the top of my head. So, Would you like to know um, what legend was released the same weekend or what movie yes. was released the same weekend? Yeah. Murphy's Law, Wise Guys, At Close Range, Water, Absolute Beginners, and Desert Bloom, of which I don't recognize any of those. Maybe Murphy's yeah. Law. And that's why Legend was number one. <laughs> that is exactly why it was number one. Yeah, it's such a shitty box office. That's why it was number one. Because it may be shitty box office, but boy, that no, as no one knows. About yeah, it. Um, this Murphy's Law, I think I recognize as kind of being like a uh, action comedy from back in the day. But yeah. Oh, Murphy's Law. No, it was um with um Charles Bronson. Huh. And again, it says 1986. Like I, you know, everything on my research, all of it's been 1985. And now also I'm looking at box office. Thing, it was like 1986. Like maybe it was released in in Europe in '85 and in America in '86. I mean, or it could be like it was released in '85 and the the final totals. Oh, that is true. Also, I think the uh, financial year for movies ends in like October or something weird. Maybe yeah, something like that. Well, always yeah. financial stuff. You know, it doesn't end like February first is first quarter. So uh, quarter four ends um December. Or, sorry, January thirty first. So anyway, the final thought is I, I highly recommend anyone listening to this to give the movie a try. You know, even if even if you gotta watch the shitty U, uh, U.S. theatrical version, well, I don't even want to say shitty. You know, it's still worth a watch, even with the, the stupid Tangerine Dream soundtrack. You know, and if nothing else, YouTube the darkness scenes. Tim Curry really nails the role. And it's really worth a few minutes of time to see him in all his evil glory, especially with his bell and goddamn horns. You know, just you know, just watch the scenes with him and with the horns and give yourself a neck ache. Yeah, man, just just he really, really, and the way he monologues and just the way he emotes, it is so worth. I, honestly, I if it wasn't for him, I would have forgotten this movie, and I think it's true for a lot of people. Yeah, Tom Tom Cruise, is fine. Yeah, he did fine. He's Tom Cruise. He's a good actor. Yeah, I don't like him, but as a person, but I think he did. I think he was fine. And Mia Farrah, or she did great, you know, for the role she's doing. And she makes you she or Mia Sarah, not Farrah. Mia Sarah, she comes across as innocent and but obnoxious, and that's kind of how she's supposed to be. You know, she's an obnoxious, spoiled princess. Who doesn't listen? Doesn't stay in her lane, <laughs> and you know it, that's just I don't know. Right to the box office legend for numbers because it was released in your Euro- the UK in eighty five and the United States in eighty six. Oh, there you go. Yep, and that's why the box office performance is usually associated with nineteen eighty six. So, Sean, do you think you'll watch it now or? Actually, oh, yeah, hey. I do kind of want to watch it to see, and then I can nice. like, mock it and make fun of it and talk to you about it and stuff. Damn. Oh, maybe not even mock and make fun of it, but 
I do kind of like dig, dig going back and watching 1980s movies, just see the old special effects that they do and the neat ways they did around things without computers. Well, I do, and uh, before we clock, before we, we die, I do want at some point talk about, talk about shitty movies. I really want to try to find a way where you and I could like watch Madam Web part, like commentary over it. I'm not sure if people watch it first, then do a, watch it again for commentary, which is probably a smarter way to do it. Um, what do you think? If, Say, you watch a movie, if, if we tear a movie apart like that, should we tear a movie like, my, my fear is if we watch it, the first time through, there'll be times where we're just like quietly watching. I try you know? to see what's going on and, instead and try of interrupting. To, well, it also look for the funny things to say. And then we finally say the funny things, even if it's a few seconds later, we're missing the beat. Or yeah. if we watch a, if we watch, if we watch it individually beforehand, we can come, come across already. better as a tightly scripted thing, I would think, as opposed to being Yeah, let's, let's see what that was. So, I mean, that is nah. something I'd like to do. We don't have to do it next, but I would like to do some. I would like to do it at some point. We could do that. Or not even not other crappy movies like Borderlands oh, no, or whatever. I, yeah, I was going to say that. Not necessarily Madame Web. Madame Web just the first thing that pops in my head for a shitty movie but hi man well that's all i got thanks for hey, that listening. was a good episode sir yes Yay. thank you for listening people at home or in your car or wherever you're at and we'll see you next time on off top right, see- yay yay now, time for a closing song this is where the ending jingle goes this is where the ending jingle goes i don't know if we need one i don't know if we'll get one but if we do then here is where it goes